Thank you, Tanya. Thank you, John. Have fun. Someone's got the clicker. You have the clicker, I think, do you? Thank you. So hi, everyone. I have the pleasure of welcoming five phenomenal people to speak in this session. Uh, these are all conservation leaders in their own right. And they have influence on ecosystems and habitats on the ground to providing leading, leading scientific analysis used in the policy landscape. So make note of your questions as we go through. We'll go through speaker by speaker, and we'll have time, hopefully, for Q&A at the end. So first up, we have Callum Maney from the UN Environment Program, World Conservation Monitoring Center. Welcome, Callum. Hello, uh, I'm Callum. I'm thrilled to be kicking off this session. Um, I'm here from UNEP WCMC, which is two things. Uh, it's a really long acronym, but it's also a partnership between the UN Environment Program and the World Conservation Monitoring Center in Cambridge. I work in the science area at UNEP WCMC, and our work includes developing the methods and the metrics that support decision making for biodiversity. And that includes what we've already heard so much about, the global biodiversity framework. I'm going to focus on that today. Specifically, I'm going to focus on the concept of ecosystem integrity, which has appeared in the goals and targets of the GBF. Okay, so how is it mentioned in the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework? It was agreed last year, there's nearly 200 signatories, and countries are now in the process of turning that agreement into national policies and processes. Now, integrity, the mystery word, appears in goal A, where by 2050, we have a goal that the integrity of ecosystems is maintained, it's enhanced, and it's restored by 2050. And that's reflected in two of the targets. Target one, about identifying areas of high integrity and protecting them. And target two, thinking about areas of low integrity and restoring them. In the monitoring framework of the Global Biodiversity Framework, the EII, or Ecosystem Integrity Index, which I'll get to in a minute, is listed as a component indicator and that suggests to us that it's going to be important for nations to track this and monitor it up to 2030. So we need to be able to measure this, but how? To give a quick recap, ecosystem integrity, it's a broad concept. It's been defined and measured in a few different ways. But broadly, the scientific community agrees that it should be related to the extent to which composition, what lives in an ecosystem, structure, the physical characteristics of that ecosystem, and function, what goes on in that ecosystem, should fall within a natural range of variation. At WCMC, we measure this with the Ecosystem Integrity Index. And this was actually introduced at the geo for good uh, Summit last year by a colleague of mine. Since then, an open source methodology for this index has come online. There's a preprint um, that's freely accessible. And this means that it's currently reproducible and accessible at the scientific level. That doesn't mean that it doesn't have a high data demand still. It does, and it has a high processing capacity required to run it. In terms of the current geospatial information that we have to do with EII, there is a static layer as part of this that's centered around data sourced from the past decade. So how does our index capture integrity? I've already spoken about composition, function, and structure. And for each of those, we establish a natural baseline and compare it to a current state. For composition, we have tens of thousands of scientific surveys that have been done in primary or minimally disturbed habitats, and they're compared to disturbed sites under different land uses and different intensities. That's then projected globally onto maps of those land uses. For function, we compare observed and potential net primary productivity models around the globe. And for structure, we compare a blank slate of landscape impacts where we have no impacts, where there are no human disturbances to the intactness of ecosystems. And we compare that to a stack of human pressures, which is landscape adjusted that we observe today. And what do we do with the integrity index? Well, you can use it to estimate impacts. And this is something that I've been focusing on when translating these methods that exist online into Earth Engine. So to estimate the impact of a given feature or a given pressure, I've chosen a random mine in Chile for this. 
you run the EII methodology to describe a current baseline for the landscape, and we're doing this in Earth Engine now. You then create a scenario, a counterfactual scenario, where that change to the landscape, either existing, planned, or prospective, doesn't exist. You then do exactly the same thing. You follow the methodology for this scenario. The difference between them is the impact on integrity of the change made. And this incorporates your landscape effects. This incorporates differences between the three models as well. So thinking again about composition, function, and structure. Now that this is in Earth Engine, in terms of assessing impact, we've done this before. But now we can operate faster and at greater scales. The fact that we can now do that has the really excellent side effect of us now being able to take an area, uh, whether it's a national area, whether it's an ecological land unit, whether it's a protected area, and we can start to say, let's disaggregate these pressures and rank them in terms of the biggest drivers of lost integrity to target them potentially for real life interventions. So two completely different examples at different scales here. An anonymous forest reserve in Ghana's structure was impacted by agriculture, urban areas, mining, and infrastructure when we pulled apart all of the different pressures underlying ecosystem integrity. We were also able to identify that agriculture was far and away the biggest contributor to that. You can also, going back to the example from earlier, operate at huge national scales now, and we can say things like existing mines in Chile decrease structural intactness of the entire country by 1%. So that's the current state of things for integrity. Um, but we have sort of a wish list that we've brought here of everything that we'd like to do to really get fit to monitor integrity for the global biodiversity framework. The first thing is to calculate EII with actors data in Earth Engine. So develop a framework or an interface to estimate EII and impacts on it using actors' data run simply on Earth Engine, whether at the level of a protected area, a community area, or even a national area, where you substitute the global layers in only where better, more local data isn't available. Secondly, we'd like to connect the Ecosystem Integrity Index to dynamic global data, using these data streams to replace the inputs that are currently tied, as I mentioned earlier, to static data or historic data. This would enable us to look at time series of ecosystem integrity, indicating progress towards or away from targets towards 2030. And the third thing that we are interested in is alerts and dashboards for decision makers. So tracked alerts and accessible dashboards of condition and threats to ecosystem integrity would provide accessible information to the people who are concerned with tracking it. So that's kind of the past and present and hopefully a bit of future for ecosystem integrity. Um, but I just wanted to say that this week, I, I came here setting these things up as obstacles, as challenges, but I've already seen projects with these principles in action. I've seen projects building local priorities and knowledge into decision-relevant national data. Dynamic World and it, all the work surrounding that is a promising global dynamic data set that's relevant to integrity. And time and time again this week, I've seen dashboards presenting live data beautifully, live analyses in web apps, all in Earth Engine. So, we want to get the necessary data, methods, and interpretation ready to monitor a key aim of the global biodiversity framework. We want countries, protected area managers, and other decision makers to be able to measure, monitor, and diagnose integrity. And after what I've seen this week, I think we're at a position where it's becoming possible. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Caleb. And now we get to welcome up Justin Sarasi from Conservation Science Partners. All right. Hi, everyone. I am thrilled to be here to talk to you about some of the work that my colleagues at CSP and I have been doing, uh, attempting to identify conservation win-wins on landscapes across the US. Um, but before I dive into that, I just want to give a quick introduction to what CSP is for those who might not know about us. We are a research-based uh, conservation nonprofit with the mission of applying human ingenuity to the preservation of nature using science, technology, and lasting partnerships. So we work with a range of other nonprofits with government agencies and private sector partners to tackle large-scale landscape and wildlife conservation challenges. 
Uh, and in my role at CSP, I help to lead our new Changing Landscapes Lab, where we focus on a number of the themes you see here below, uh, things like mitigating and adapting to climate change, facilitating ecological connectivity, but where a cross-cutting theme for everything we do in the lab is, uh, is a desire to identify conservation solutions that simultaneously uh, address multiple objectives. So where can we focus our efforts to tackle multiple ch challenges simultaneously and thereby reap multiple benefits from the investment of conservation resources? And to put a finer point on this idea of balancing multiple objectives, I'm gonna uh, talk through two examples today where we've tried to address uh, two challenges that have many interacting components. So the first is uh, the dual crises of climate change and biodiversity loss that we're all very much painfully aware of, but that have helped to galvanize efforts to expand protected areas, both nationally and across the globe, including through a range of 30 by 30 initiatives, relevant to this meeting, obviously. Uh, but the key challenge remains of identifying which landscapes we should target for new protections that will simultaneously address both crises, right? It could be the case that the best acres on a landscape for uh, mitigating climate change are not necessarily the best for protecting species habitat, et cetera. So where do we find those win-wins? Um, I'm also going to throw in a quick uh, related example um, about proactively mitigating wildfire risk through treatments that reduce the likelihood of high severity fires. Uh, this is another important goal in a changing climate, uh, but in order to do so effectively, we need to account for climate risks, for ecosystem processes, and most importantly, perhaps for the human communities that are likely to be impacted by fires. So the challenge here again is where to target our fire mitigation efforts to achieve these multiple benefits. Okay, so I'll talk to you about a couple of uh, custom decision support tools that we've developed uh, that are meant to, again, aid conservation on U.S. lands. The first is the Climate Atlas, again, targeting new protections to jointly address both climate change and biodiversity loss. And the second is focused on uh, wildfire mitigation on U.S. Forest Service lands, again, balancing these multiple objectives and our risk reduction treatments. I don't really have time to get too deep into the methods today, but would love to chat with anybody after, afterwards about this. But uh, in essence, both of these approaches uh, rely on either developing in-house or compiling high-quality, uh, large-scale spatial data layers that are indicators for key ecological, environmental, and social uh, factors. So these could be things like uh, layers describing ecological connectivity or endangered species richness or uh, social factors such as the vulnerability of communities to, to disasters. We combine all these data layers into what we call composite indices, essentially adding everything up and producing a heat map that allows managers and policymakers to zoom in on just those locations that are going to satisfy multiple objectives simultaneously. We use a relatively new optimized weights approach to ensure that each of these values gets equal representation in the, in the indicators of the maps that we produce. Um, and just as a note, uh, all of this work relies very heavily on Earth Engine tools and data sets and compute power. So Obviously, thank you to the Google people for that. All right, so the Climate Atlas, again, it's uh, focused on informing 30 by 30 and really any other conservation objective to meet biodiversity and, and climate goals. And the way that we approach this is by developing a series of these composite index models, these, these heat maps, uh, one focusing specifically on the best places on the landscape to mitigate climate change, another focusing specifically on biodiversity, and then a third that draws all these things together to find out where these uh, conservation win-wins occur across the landscape. And then we can identify high value, currently unprotected, lands across the U.S. that are targets for new conservation. Um, we have a quick video that we'll go to now, hopefully, uh, to, to preview what this looks like. So this is the Climate Atlas. Uh, it's, uh, we've got, as I mentioned, multiple data layers included here relevant to climate change, like total carbon, uh, re relevant to biodiversity, like imperiled species richness, and ecological connectivity. Uh, these things all get integrated into a set of models, as I was just mentioning. So these are the best uh, spots on the landscape for targeting climate mitigation, the highest, high hot spots on the landscape for targeting biodiversity, and then our composite model combines everything so you can uh, zoom in on the exact spots on the landscape where you might be able to jointly address these multiple conservation challenges. Importantly, we did this both for the lower 48 states and for Alaska, and provide a handful of context layers for, for planners and managers to view, including existing protected areas, existing threats on the ground <clears throat> from oil and gas development, for instance. And then to try to make these uh, results as actionable as possible, we focus specifically on currently unprotected public lands on the US Forest Service and BLM domain. Uh, you can filter these lands to just those landscapes that have uh, acres in the highest conservation value as predicted 
predicted by our models, zoom in on your landscape of choice, and get a summary of uh, essentially how much land in a particular parcel is going to contribute to, um, to these conservation values um, going forward. All right, and so just a few outcomes of that. We've uh, published all this stuff recently in a paper that came out this year in Ecosphere, where we showed that only about 12% of lands in the lower 48 states and 28% in Alaska of the highest conservation value lands as identified by our models are currently protected, which means that there's huge opportunity to increase the protected area estate uh, in ways that will capture these really high value lands. We identified over 500 million acres of high value unprotected land um, across the US that could be targets for uh, 30 by 30 initiatives. Uh, we're trying to put these results, or have put these results in the hands of decision makers at the White House, um, the Department of Interior, uh, USDA, among others, to try to inform um, public lands planning going forward. I'll just quickly touch on uh, one other example here that's focused on informing wildfire treatments, specifically on US Forest Service lands that uh, benefit vulnerable communities and ecological values. And in this case, we're defining socially vulnerable communities as those with uh, limited capacity to recover from or respond to a wildfire event. And the objective here is to try to identify places uh, on the BLM, or sorry, on the US Forest Service footprint where A, uh, wildfire mitigation treatments, things like fuels reductions, are likely to actually be effective at reducing the severity of fires in the future. That's based on the biophysical properties of the forest itself. But then also B, where you are likely to be able to safeguard uh, vulnerable communities and have uh, benefits for important ecological processes and ecosystem services. So things like carbon storage and the provisioning of clean drinking water to communities. So this flow chart on the, on the left-hand side here shows how we, uh, how we put all this stuff together, but essentially we created a bunch of these composite indices, combined them, and found places on the landscape where both these social and ecological values overlap with the places that are at high risk for fire, but also high likelihood of success uh, in the event of wildfire treatments. And we define a set of focal areas that can be, that can be essentially starting points for thinking through where you might achieve multiple benefits, um, wildfire mitigations. And the idea here is that this can serve as a complement to existing wildfire prioritizations that are, in many cases, focused largely on risk to structures, and we ask how can we re refine those existing priorities to target important social and ecological values while still being able to reduce wildfire risk. So again, we're working all this up in, uh, for publication in the scientific literature as well and focusing on how refining existing priorities, so in this case, uh, US Forest Service fire sheds with our focal areas would help draw attention towards uh, and draw restoration efforts towards areas that, for instance, would represent 50% uh, more families below the poverty line or 39% uh, more forest carbon while still achieving your uh, fire mitigation goals. Uh, and we're again putting this work into the hands of decision makers at USDA, uh, DOI, and working with other NGOs to, to integrate this work into, into wildfire restoration planning. Okay, and that's it. I just wanted to quickly uh, thank all the collaborators and uh, other folks that have uh, supported this work and note that we are in a critical moment to address these multifaceted and interacting conservation challenges. And CSP, is a, we're really excited to be invited here and to have the opportunity to potentially collaborate with Google and with other, uh, with other researchers in the room today on these issues and leverage our unique combination of technical skills, data access, and networks of collaborators uh, to make real progress here. So thanks very much. Thank you so much, Justin. And now we get to hear from Dave Theobald. Connectivity between the centrality, ecosystem integrity, leading scientist on many of these topics and more. So welcome, Dave. Well, wow, thank you, Tanya. Thank, uh, thanks, everybody. Good morning. Um, yeah, I'd like to talk about uh, three, three, maybe four components of this uh, 30 by 30 uh, issue. Um, Super important, urgent uh, to address, uh, and of course, uh, recently the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework was passed, so this is uh, loosely known as 30 by 30, but it, it's, it's sort of bigger than this, and it's, it's kind of messy, and in that messiness, there is a lot of opportunity. It's messy, in a sense, because it's an evolving process. It has 
perhaps four different communities, uh, the science community, the practitioner, uh, the technology community, uh, roughly, you know, folks here uh, as well, um, the policy community, and then also, you know, the communities on the ground who are, who are affected. So all those come together uh, in what we're all trying to address here. So um, as was talked about before, so I'll go uh, reasonably quickly, uh, goal A is about ecosystem integrity. Um, underneath that goal, there are a variety of targets. Target three is one of the main ones that I've been uh, working, uh, on, uh, working on in, in collaboration with a number of, of partners. So, and that has that express uh, target of 30% by 2030. Importantly, there are a couple other components there that sort of get left out, and that is that they need to be well connected and ecologically represented. So we need to be thinking about those as well, not just the per percent coverage. Um, and then importantly, the coverage of natural ecosystems. That's, that's what's called a headline indicator, a major, majorly important indicator as well. So I, I want to talk about how we've uh, addressed these. So uh, first one, coverage of natural ecosystems. And so first you have to think about what's, what is natural? Uh, what is natural? How do we define that? Uh, and so that's a big philosophical debate that we can descend to. A practical response, pragmatic answer is really to detail what human modification uh, has uh, is out on the landscape due to threats and stressors. So on the on the left hand side there we have a, a broad threats classification that we've uh, that we build on uh, from from the IUCN and earlier academic work. It's important because we develop a parsimonious set of stressors and threats rather than bringing together, you know, a whole kitchen, uh, kitchen, uh, you know, everything in the kitchen sink. So I'm going to present a few global projects, but we've also applied some of this work at a variety of scales, at national scale, transboundary scale, et cetera. Um, a number of the products that we're working on uh, are, include this human uh, modification data set. Um, existing uh, versions are already in the data catalog. They're also in the awesome uh, catalog uh, as well. Um, we're currently working on and will be releasing um, uh, trends data set from 1990 to 20, uh, 2022. A current one will be updating those on an annual basis. Resolution is about 300 meters. We're, we're uh, also looking at a uh, finer resolution as well. We're also providing uh, not just the overall measure, but also uh, the individual threats. So agricultural built up, uh, extractive, human intrusion, human accessibility, uh, natural systems, and then also transportation uh, in infrastructure. A couple papers that describe a lot of the, the details. The details are important. Not enough time to talk about those. How do we use these? We can begin to report them. So it is important to be able to have a globally consistent uh, database and methodology to be able to evaluate that. That's how we can compare things. Of course, we also need to be able to scale down to region and to local uh, areas as well. And so monitoring and downscaling, we're also uh, engaged in that. These data have uh, been used uh, for a variety of connectivity exercises, including uh, the California Connectivity Project uh, through the Nature Conservancy, uh, about a year or two old now. Um, okay, so one of, the, one of the pieces is protected and connected, um, and so we developed a, a metric called PRONET. Um, and so as you can see, it's, a, it's designed specifically to measure uh, and, and assess connectivity. Um, and to do this in a rapidly, uh, uh, in a very quick way. Previous measures uh, have taken months to run, literally globally. Um, in Earth Engine, being able to do this on, in about an hour's uh, basis um, for all countries and, and uh, for ecosystems, uh, eco regions as well. Also, I've been thinking a lot about this connectivity framework here. As, we, as people engage in the conversations about what connectivity is, um, it can be challenging, definitional issues. I mean, and, and this is challenging within the scientific community and the technology community as well, and the policy community especially. We want connectivity. It means a, a, a 
a thousand different things, maybe not a thousand, maybe a hundred. Uh, and so we've talked about this connectivity framework. So I think that's important uh, as people talk about what is an indicator, what is a complementary indicator, what is a metric. There, there are some definitions here that you can see um, how, how we've been doing it. Uh, this, this methodology, PRONET, we published that uh, recently last year. Um, and uh, this has also been um, approved in the, uh, in the GBF uh, recently as well, so PRONET as an indicator. What do the outputs look like? Here's an example of a graph of countries. So what's the percent protected on the x-axis and the percent connected on the y-axis? So you can very quickly, I think very easily, uh, understand where different uh, countries are located on there. Um, hopefully, I put a little label on there where, uh, of course, as you can inspect this and you can imagine this up on a dashboard, you'd be able to understand these things, uh, where different countries are. Importantly, that provides context. So if I'm going to add a, an additional protected area, is it going to contribute uh, to the percent connected as well, if we want to uh, simultaneously achieve that. And so we've run some, uh, some um, preliminary analyses of uh, you know, the, the percentage of uh, um, connected uh, countries is about 38% uh, connected uh, within uh, protected areas within a country, of course. Okay, uh, next one we want to think about is um, representation. We did a uh, analysis of, of six major mount, global mountain ranges, um, and we wanted to understand the degree to which those were um, protected the ecosystems within those regions were protected. So we built up uh, some, some ecosystem uh, data layers because I, th I think we need to, to uh, uh, examine that and there's a, there's a, a really important uh, set of work to be done there, uh, defining ecosystems that are much higher resolution and, and much more relevant at a local level. This is a graph showing uh, each of the dots are uh, ecosystems. And again, you can look at the context. Are they protected? Um, and what's their setting within the degree of human modification? And some preliminary numbers there. Okay, uh, lastly, um, how can we begin to kind of uh, pull those together into ecosystem integrity in general? Um, and so here we calculate it as a permeability uh, both within and between an ecosystem um, within some sort of an ecological distance, uh, very similar um, definition of ecological integrity where we're looking at the uh, uh, components of composition, structure, and function. Um, just going to do a quick example here uh, in uh, Central Africa. This is the human modification, which we use as the, the resistance surface in our connectivity model. Uh, these are uh, using potential natural vegetation as our, our ecosystems, our, our objects, our ecological objects of, of interest. Um, and I'll create a uh, a connectivity model for each of these in turn. So this, this uses a, a connectivity model within, um, within Earth Engine, white being uh, more permeable, black being less permeable. We can do that in turn for each of the um, four different ecosystems here. So you can see uh, some regional differentiation. Um, I'll go a little faster. Last one, uh, herbaceous, um, and then we can we can compile these together. So we can look at um, some uh, sort of ecosystem specific, but also look at the the combination uh, of those in a in a more compound way. So um, last slide, thinking about um, some broader implementation kinds of challenges. There are a number of details here. Um, just wanted to hit on, on uh, three takeaways here, and that is uh, 30 by 30 really is a shorthand uh, for some of the general goals of ecosystem integrity. And importantly, think about it's not just the percentage, it's about is it well connected? What does well mean? <laughs> you, should be, you should be asking. I don't have an answer for it uh, quite yet. Uh, representative ecosystems is important. Permeability and connectivity are sort of from the opposite ends of the, the spectrum, um, looking at fragmentation. So I think that that's a really uh, important uh, definitional issues. And then the last one, um, thinking about uh, 
that, that it is of, of value to have these global, uh, global analyses, global comparisons. Of course, we also need to be think about how those uh, are appropriate for and can be downscaled and localized, et cetera, with uh, uh, higher resolution data, uh, more recent uh, data, et cetera, and more relevant data for the communities that are involved uh, in, in the decision making uh, in the conservation there. So thanks very much. Thanks so much, Dave. Next up, we've got Kendall Jones from the Wildlife Conservation Society. Thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks, Tanya. Thanks for being here. Um, I want to talk today about forest restoration. It's a, it's a global priority at the moment. We have explicit targets set in the Global Biodiversity Framework, 30 by 30 target, and a range of other initiatives from the public and private sector aimed at restoring forest in extent and integrity in order to deliver on goals for climate change, biodiversity, and sustainable and equitable development. So a lot of attention in the media and in the scientific literature when we're talking about restoration focuses on images like you can see on the left-hand side of the slide here, these heavily impacted deforested areas where we're talking about really active reforestation efforts to bring back forest where it's been totally lost. And while that kind of activity is vital in the fight against climate change and biodiversity loss, Restoration actually kind of occurs on a continuum of ecological integrity from those heavily impacted areas all the way through to intact forests where protection and maintenance of integrity should be the highest priority. And then in between those two ends of the spectrum, you also have degraded forests where human, human impacts have reduced the ecological integrity and the condition of forests, but they may not have led to total deforestation. And in those places, you also have the potential for a combination of actions such as active reforestation as well as the um, potential for natural forest recovery in order to improve forest integrity and deliver all the benefits of forest restoration. So in order to get a better understanding of the true global potential for restoration activity, we've developed and published a paper just recently looking at mapping biophysical restoration potential across that spectrum of ecological integrity. So what we did was use Google Earth Engine to look at current biomass levels and compare those to predictions of maximum natural biomass levels in order to quantify restoration potential in three illustrative categories of intervention. So that map has four categories. Dark green is intact forest where there's no restoration action needed. And then we have three categories of intervention. Brown represents those heavily impacted and deforested areas where active reforestation is likely to be required. Light green shows degraded forest where natural forest recovery is likely to be what's needed. And then we have a mixed category in between where a combination of both of those approaches is likely to be necessary. Um, so when we're thinking about restoration at the global scale like this, it's obviously very important to avoid promoting restoration where it's ecologically or socially uh, infeasible or problematic. So what we've done to try and avoid those things is we've excluded grasslands and uh, sparsely wooded savannas where we don't want to promote afforestation that might negatively impact those ecosystems. We've also removed urban areas, oil palm, forest plantations, areas that are kind of infeasible for restoration. And we've also removed areas that are uh, might be climatically counterproductive if we do restoration because it can change albedo and reduce the amount of uh, reflection that leads to warming. So what we found after we did all that, we removed all those unsuitable areas, is that there's a huge amount of degraded forest that has the potential for restoration activities. In fact, over 40% of the total potential area that could be restored falls into that category of degraded forest that has the potential to have its integrity restored and improved. And that's really important because not only does that sort of unlock a new potential area for restoration to go alongside the traditional methods of, of kind of active reforestation where forest has been totally lost. It's also important because degraded forests have the potential to deliver gains for climate and biodiversity more rapidly in many cases than totally deforested areas. That's because they retain some of the structure, the ecological processes and the species that you find in intact forests. They can also have lower conflict for land use and lower opportunity costs because you're working in places that haven't been totally converted to anthropogenic land uses. So beyond just kind of quantifying how much potential there is for restoration across the globe, we at the Wildlife Conservation Society wanted to sort of work out where would be the highest priority places for us to focus our, our restoration 
efforts. So we developed a simple priority setting approach based on four key considerations. We looked at the proximity to existing intact forests. Um, prioritizing those places is good because having intact forests nearby is something that increases the chances that your restoration is actually going to succeed ecologically. And it's also important to us because we, we're all about protecting intact forests. And so by restoring degraded forests around those intact forest patches, you can help to buffer them against future deforestation or degradation. We prioritize working in protected areas and key biodiversity areas where we can. We prioritize sites that have higher carbon sequestration rates so they can more rapidly deliver climate goals. And we include data on existing cropland, not to totally exclude cropland, but rather to prioritize working in sites that are less intensively used for agriculture in order to avoid land use conflicts and um, lower opportunity costs. So these are some of the example results for those prioritization, uh, those prioritization analyses. I've zoomed into the five great forests of Mesoamerica here, which is one of our priority landscapes. And I've separated the results out into those three illustrative categories of intervention that we talked about before. So you have reforestation, where land's been severely impacted and deforested in map A. You have forest recovery in map C, where you still have forest, but it's been degraded and could likely naturally recover if you could control threats like grazing and fire are the main threats in this landscape. And then you have that mixed category in between in map B, which is likely to require a combination of approaches. So by thinking about restoration in this way, it's kind of unique because it's not only giving you information on the, the highest priority locations that you might want to explore for restoration projects, which are shown in the, the darker colors on these maps, but it's also telling you about what kinds of intervention might be required to achieve that restoration and, those, and deliver on those climate and biodiversity goals. So we're currently working with our country teams in this region to refine the analysis at a local scale um, and plan our future restoration activities. And when we're thinking about sort of downscaling the results of a global analysis like this, it's important to think about not just using the results as is, but rather to take this as kind of a flexible framework or a way that you can think about planning restoration activities and to incorporate local scale data, local contextual information wherever you can. Um, that helps to really make sure that your planning is relevant to the, the place or the situation that you're working with. So for example, in Guatemala, we're looking at incorporating data on fire severity and burn frequency, because that's a really important driver of forest degradation in the region. Uh, to that end, we've also developed a Google Earth Engine web app, um, which is kind of embarrassingly simple compared to all the, f the fun, cool stuff that I've been seeing this, this week. But um, it's been powerful for us because it gives real-time visualization of the results and allows people to tweak what indicators are included and how they're weighted. And then they can kind of see by panning around the region that they know what's driving the results in their region and how the results look like for places that they're interested in. So despite being simple, it's been really useful and powerful for us. Finally, when you're promoting restoration or thinking about restoration projects, we always want to make sure that we're thinking about local considerations and avoiding promoting or calling for restoration in ways that might be impacting local people. So thinking about things like land tenure, land use history, um, the willingness of landowners to engage in restoration, the opportunity costs that they might uh, be impacted by if they're engaged in restoration. Those are all kinds of important considerations to make sure that you're thinking about when you're working at the, at the regional, the local scale. And finally, WCS isn't just working alone on this. We're part of a partnership called Trillion Trees with WWF and BirdLife International, really aiming to speed up and scale up action on forest restoration across the world. We've developed the Reforest Fund, which basically gives funders access to a proven portfolio of robust restoration products, projects, which are also all aiming to deliver on biodiversity, climate, and sustainable development goals. And to go along with that, we have Formap, which is a Google Earth-based restoration monitoring tool that people use on their phone out in the field and that delivers credible, transparent impact verification for all of the projects in the Reforest Fund. So if you're interested in learning more about that partnership, whether as a restoration practitioner, as a funder who's looking to get access to good restoration projects, um, I'd be happy to discuss any time today, or you can find all of my contact details up there and check out the app on the QR code. Thanks very much. Awesome, thank you, Kendall. And now we have a little bit of a pivot 
for Elise Mazur from WRI, World Resources Institute, who um, is going to tell us a little bit about uh, the, you know, how corporations also have a role to play in 30 by 30 through the science-based targets network, and maybe a little TNFD in there, task force or nature-related financial disclosures, but mostly uh, natural lands map. Over to you, Elise. Thanks, Tanya. Um, yeah, I'm Elise. I work on Land and Carbon Lab at the World Resources Institute. And we've heard some, some great work about forests and, and other lands. Um, but I want to yeah, think beyond forests and go uh, to corporate targets for all nature. So there are a lot of um, efforts and legislation, like the EU deforestation regulation, that are holding corporations accountable for avoiding deforestation in their supply chains. Um, but in order to achieve the 30 by 30 goals, we need to protect lands outside of forests as well, globally. So um, that brings us to the Science-Based Targets Network, which is a voluntary corporate target setting guidance for nature. You may have heard of SBTI, which is target uh, guidance for reducing emissions, but SBTN is for uh, protecting nature. So there are targets currently on freshwater and land. We're gonna talk about one of the land targets, but um, the others are all are out there for you to find. Um, so the target that we'll talk about today is target number one, no conversion of natural ecosystems, um, where we want corporations to stop direct and indirect conversion of all natural ecosystems to non-natural ecosystems uh, in their supply chains. Um, I'll briefly mention the other two, which are a land footprint reduction for large agricultural corporations, um, and then landscape engagement, where we encourage all the companies working on any of these targets to engage locally with initiatives um, that are enabling improvements to nature and livelihoods uh, where they're producing or sourcing their products from. Okay, so to focus on this first one, no conversion of natural ecosystems, the goal is to get corporations to reach 100% compliance of conversion-free and deforestation-free requirements by a target date, like 2025 or 2027. Um, and so this means that everything they're producing or sourcing um, has to come from land that has not been converted since 2020. In a few cases, it's earlier, but most of it is for 2020. So in order to do that, we need to know where uh, was quote unquote natural and where and if it's been converted or not. So they came to, so uh, SBTN came to WRI um, and asked, okay, we need to figure out what this means and where this is. So that begs the question, as we've already started exploring, what is natural? Um, so uh, for SBTN, we've adopted definitions from the accountability framework, and we've uh, uh, started working with those to kind of map them and, and make them mappable. Um, so here they define a natural ecosystem as one that substantially resembles what would be found in a given area in the absence of major human impacts. Um, and again, what a human impact is, is debatable, but we uh, just want to point out here that this means for our use case that it can include and does include managed ecosystems as well as degraded ecosystems. Um, I also want to point out that in the technical note, which you'll find a link to on the next slide, um, we have a full detailed definition of what we mean for each land cover that we map. And we also have a new work stream uh, with the Accountability Framework Initiative to uh, make these definitions more mappable and flesh them out for non-forest uh, ecosystems because they're uh, a bit vague at the moment. And I'm really excited to work with everyone up here to, to improve the definitions. Okay, so um, for this, we created this map of natural lands. Um, this is a beta version. Uh, we're gonna come out with the first official version next year. Um, but you can see it's just a binary of natural and non-natural. Um, we call this lands because we're not mapping ecosystem. We're, ecosystems, we're mapping land cover. And since we're land cover people, behind this you can actually find all the land covers. Um, so all the data are there. Um, and there is a, there's a QR code for this. Um, I also have it on the last slide if you can't catch it now. But you may be wondering, okay, how do companies use this uh, for their targets? So uh, companies need to find supplementary data that show that there's been land cover change uh, where they're producing or sourcing their data, uh, their products from. Um, and then once they have that supplementary data, which could be imagery, could be land cover change data, tree cover loss data, whatever, um, then they look at this map and they say, okay, in the area that there was land cover change, was it natural before or in 2020? 
So um, SBTN also wanted to prioritize some land, and so they created this core natural lands class, which takes into account a bunch of different data sets that you can see here, like critical natural assets, minimum land areas for conserving terrestrial biodiversity, irrecoverable carbon, soil biodiversity hotspots, um, threatened ecosystems, and the natural forest class, as well as some IUCN data. Um, to add this additional layer on, so in dark green here, you can see the core natural lands um, from far away, it kind of just looks like everywhere but deserts, but if you zoom in, <laughs> there's some more detail and nuance there. Okay, so since we're at GeoForget, I just wanted to quickly talk about how we made the map. Um, again, you can find this all in a technical note, but we combined a bunch of different land cover data sets and removed areas from some and added areas from others. Um, we used uh, GLAD land cover data from UMD. We also used some classes from ESA World Cover, um, EASA Mines, uh, additional cropland data, additional intact forest landscape data, uh, the spatial data of planted trees, and I'm sure many of you are wondering how we got to grasslands and natural grasslands and, or short vegetation. Um, currently, we are using the FAO gridded livestock of the world with a density threshold to say above this threshold is definitely non-natural grasslands or short vegetation, um, but we, all, we are all very eager for um, new WRI data that's coming out soon on global pasture and grassland, and that will greatly improve uh, this work. Um, lastly, we wanted this map to be applicable at a local scale since companies are using it at a local scale, so it was really important to us to have local data where possible. Currently, this is the in dark gray, the extent of where we have local data, and so I, um, my call to action to you is to, to please share local uh, land cover data that you have that may help disaggregate um, natural from non-natural land covers. Uh, even if it's just one class. Um, as you can see here, we have uh, just some grassland data in uh, Europe from Corinne. We've got map biomass data um, across South America and Indonesia, some cocoa data in West Africa, and some land cover data in uh, South Africa and New Zealand. Um, and yeah, I'm happy to answer questions about the map when we get to the Q&A now. Thank you. Awesome, thanks so much for all these stellar presentations. Um, that's all right. <laughs> well, you could go to the next one. It's probably a Q&A side. Yes, Q&A. So um, if you've got questions, there's a couple mics over here. Um, we do have time for questions. We also have a session uh, later today. It's the last breakout session in case you want to percolate a little bit on it and, um, and have a more of a discussion there. So any questions? I know I'm be we're between you guys and lunch. <laughs> Oh, yeah, go for it. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, I've got a question. Well, maybe to everyone, I guess. It's mostly to Elise. Um, all these guys talked about these awesome integrity maps that they're making. Um, is there any scope for companies to use those data to supplement the natural, non-natural map that you presented to sort of better plan? If they do have to have an impact, it would be better to happen in a, less, a, a place with less integrity than in a really intact place. Or are they already doing that? Absolutely. Um, yeah, it's not currently included. Those maps aren't currently included in the natural lands map, but um, I definitely feel like there is space for f when they're doing future planning to incorporate the integrity maps. Um, EII is uh, being discussed for, for use in, in SVTN, <laughs> definitely. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, I think like when, when companies are setting their targets and when they're measuring where there has been conversion, they do need uh, remote sensing data instead of model data, but I feel like, yeah, they all need to work really closely together and ideally can fit together. Yeah, that seems to be one of the, like, one of the most pressing um, challenges for our community as, you know, scientific community is how do you bring in a lot of local data, right, that, like, complements these large global scale or large regional scale so that you get better and better indices, and that is often such a participatory process or the restoration on the ground, right, that like needs a lot of local leadership and local involvement and that takes time. Anybody have any thoughts about that? <laughs> Sorry, it's a nugget. <laughs> well, one of the techniques we've, we've used uh, in the past and we're thinking about doing with uh, some of our future work is um, to actually engage uh, those, uh, you know, the community folks, the stakeholders in collecting uh, on the ground sort of truth or validation data. So it's, it's both capture the, their knowledge of particular places that they're interested in, um, and so they have some ownership over it, but also from the science perspective, think about 
asking them to engage in providing some data to um, to help validate the data. Um, so this sort of gets away from the my favorite, you know, pixel kind of issue when you look at it and kind of go, no, well, that, it worked or it didn't, therefore the map, the whole map is either good or bad. So try, mm -hmm. trying to engage them a, you know, a little bit more in an active process. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, kind of related to that, we, I view this kinds of like global analysis that I presented and maybe similar for these other ones, like really useful for planning at a broad scale for example, for restoration, identifying like which, which location in a country would be a high priority because of carbon stocks or rapid ability to make rapid carbon gains or whichever the indicator is that you're interested in. But that's not going to give you detailed information on exactly where you want to work. So that requires going to the communities, working with them, working out where it's feasible, where it's suitable. So it's kind of like a bottom up and a top down approach together. Yeah, I mean, one other, um, oh, is, do we have a, oh yeah, great, is that Annie? <laughs> that, that's Annie. <laughs> great, <laughs> welcome Annie. <laughs> Thanks, hey everybody, Thanks for an awesome presentations. It's super interesting to see different approaches and the ways your approaches are synergistic. Um, I don't know how you might answer this question, especially at the scale that many of y'all are working at, but I, in the ecosystems I work in in California, many of them are disturbance, disturbance dependent. So these super biodiverse grasslands need um, human stewardship and in many cases have depended on millennia of indigenous stewardship to still exist. And in the absence of maybe fire or other forms of management, the grasslands disappear and become forests. Um, which is a loss of biodiversity. So I wonder, there's lots of focus in each of your uh, models on areas where human modification is low, but how might you think about, or any of you thinking about where human stewardship and indigenous stewardship in particular is actually necessary to preserve that biodiversity? Thank you. I mean, the simple answer for, my, for our work is that at that global scale, we don't take into that consideration those kinds of things because it, we don't really have a method to do so, I don't think. I would say that the definition that we work with for ecological integrity is completely okay to have that kind of like management that's occurring over a long time that's maintaining those processes. It's not, ex it's not exclusive of those kinds of processes. Um, so I don't think that it's contextual, co conceptually a problem, but actually incorporating it into the analysis at this scale, at a global scale, I don't think we have figured out a good way to do that. So that would, I guess it would come in at the at the local kind of scale. That's not a very satisfying answer, but yeah. Yeah, and uh, some of the approaches that we've used to, to measure essentially um, human modification, very similar to what, uh, to what Dave's pioneered, focuses a lot on the built environment. So like urbanization, put, putting in transportation infrastructure, energy infrastructure. So wouldn't necessarily, if we're using that type of layer to, to discount areas in terms of their, their biodiversity or their conservation value wouldn't necessarily exclude um, on the ground and especially indigenous management, but I'll admit that our maps don't have a great way to incorporate the need for that management, the positive value that that brings. So that's a, that is a really important point to bring forward. Yeah, please. Hi, thank you so much for your talks. Um, so I'm curious with all of the maps that we've seen, both on regional and global scales, how do you get your data and your maps, your apps, in the, in the hands of the policymakers? And if and when you do, to what extent do they look at your methodology? Or do they more look at like the, the pretty picture that you display? I can give that one a try too. <laughs> That's a really great question. I mean, the way that we do it is just to like cold email and cold call a bunch of people and try to get meetings with policymakers and show off our, our apps and maps and try to tap networks to put it in the right people's hands. Uh, we've had some success um, uh, with these, these tools getting integrated into to actual management, but I, I think it's a really tricky problem because we're hardly the only ones trying to do that. There's a bunch of other organizations that are trying to, to, trying to in very genuine ways, inform uh, policy and management, and uh, some coordination across the conservation community would be great so that these policymakers aren't just getting inundated with a thousand tools that all sort of overlap, so important point. Yeah. Yeah, great. Yeah, let me build on that. Um, yeah, absolutely. That's that's a bit of the the process that I alluded to earlier with 
in the IUCN and the GBF. So there's, you know, there, there are forums, there's, uh, there are, right now there's an ad hoc uh, technical advisory group working through some of those kinds of issues. Um, I've had conversations about trying to provide some guidance documents. So there's a guidance document uh, that uh, Jody Hilty led and, and others were involved in um, to try to explain some of those ideas. The degree to which um, uh, you know, these decision makers are, are making use of it based on a map or maybe understanding the methodology. I mean, we have to, we have, to, we, we have this idea of there, there's a decision maker out there. Well, the decision maker is part of this whole program and team and they are relying on, oftentimes they have technical folks, you know, like us who are, you know, deep into the methodology. So, um, I mean, it's it's a process, and I think you know, going down from the the global level, you know, there are country representatives, and um, in my mind, I think that there's a, a really interesting opportunity. A number of the big, you know, the big countries, perhaps you know, U.S. or Canada um, or Brazil, there's there's pretty sophisticated work already involved at that level, and then there's perhaps places where there's uh, you know very little data data or little capacity and I think that that's a, a really nice niche that that perhaps uh, we can we can provide in a in a different fashion so thanks great question thank you do we want to go to the side of the room yeah sure um, just a question on the scaling issue um, I wanted to know how is it or what kind of thought do you put into making the indices uh, kind of flexible across scales and across contexts and what might be the limitations of, of the indices? Yeah, I, I guess I'd, I'd take a stab at that. Um, I generally think, you know, that the highest resolution possible is really important, I think, particularly for connectivity modeling. Right, um, uh, you know, to get at fragmentation, uh, perhaps a you know a road or linear infrastructure is one of the most important things. And so, when we look at a you know one kilometer pixel, I've never seen a one kilometer <laughs> wide uh, uh, highway, even <laughs> even in Southern California. <laughs> Sorry, uh, but uh, so anyway, so you know, uh, the highest resolution typically is is really important. Um, yeah, and then I think that there are also some methodological issues about not just always going with uh, perhaps the arithmetic mean, for example. I think there are some other statistical analyses that look at landscape data, uh, which is hardly ever, you know, normal distribution. We shouldn't be, we shouldn't, we should never say never, but uh, uh, I think that there are a lot of other methodologies that, that we need to be thinking about, and it would be great to try and incorporate, make those easy uh, to be incorporated into uh, Earth Engine, for example. Thanks. Any other thoughts? Maybe just a simple thing is that when you're talking about a global analysis and you want to then look at it for a specific country like Jamaica, for example, it's unlikely that all of the, the data sets that we use to make that global layer are gonna be the best available for Jamaica. So you can take the methodology, the framework of how it was calculated, but if you can plug in local scale data sets that are better, use the same framework, then you can probably generate something better quite easily. Yeah, I agree. I, I would just, sorry, add to, add to that is, it, it, right, it depends upon the question. So if, if you're wanting to think about, you know, trying to make a compelling case, oftentimes you need to have, you know, a temporal, a historical slice to be able to understand the trends, oftentimes that forces you to some of these global platforms, right? So we want to look at Landsat, it, and, and we've seen many examples here that, uh, so oftentimes I sort of s separate that kind of question. Are we trying to make a compelling case uh, to motivate people versus are we planning for near and, and how, and uh, for, for near and now and, and here? So anyway, I, I think that's useful to separate. Yeah, and if I can also quickly just follow up on that, got that precise case. I think what Kendall said about um, it being frameworks rather than sort of top-down methodologies is really important because it means that you can get down to more local scales and you can work with different priorities. There will come to the point where even the framework 
doesn't necessarily capture the difference between, let's say, two important different changes at a very hyper-local scale. And at that point, you know, the, the global methods do break down. Um, and you have to start leaning on the more local and the more hyper-specific, not just data, but, but knowledge and methodologies there too. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Jorge, I'm very sorry, but we're going to go to this side of the room. Well, sorry, Jorge. Um, <laughs> well, thanks everyone for the great presentations. Uh, one of the points that stood out to me was this super high resolution area of like, here's the areas we want to protect if we want to preserve the rare and endangered species, but those are not necessarily the areas that are being protected. <laughs> um, and so kind of building on one of the previous questions, like what's the biggest barrier to shifting the, that focus to those actual areas? And you mentioned talking to policymakers, is it mainly governmental policymakers or, and who are the other actors involved? Are there like, uh, you know, philanthropic and or corporate private donations or like to, yeah, to protecting those lands? Yeah, um, I think maybe the biggest barriers to protecting the highest conservation value lands, and again, you know, that's just what our models suggest are high conservation value lands, but like historically have been that maybe that wasn't even necessarily the focus, right? It's a lot easier to protect areas that are not actively being used that are like rock and ice, for instance, or have really nice um, uh, scenic vistas, et cetera. Uh, so it hopefully, to some degree, having appropriate information helps to solve that problem. Uh, but obviously there has to be, there's a whole bunch of other um, constraints that are gonna get in the way. So uh, we focus specifically in that uh, web app that I showed on currently unprotected public lands that could be as easy as you know um, an executive order to create a national monument, et cetera. But we also mapped everything across the US uh, with the hope that uh, even on private lands, you might have um, possibilities for things like conservation easements, et cetera. Um, you know, I did very conveniently gloss over the actual mechanisms to, to do protection because that part gets extremely complicated. But yeah, hopefully through communities like this, we can uh, engage stakeholders. And if you're gonna protect something, you want, you've got a 30 by 30 goal, Biden administration has a 30 by 30 goal, you know, focus on these areas first. I'll just add really quickly that, yes, corporations are like definitely one of the stakeholders in this. And I think one of the biggest challenges is traceability. So co corporations knowing where they're getting their products from because sometimes they're so high up the supply chain that they don't have that understanding and that leads to huge issues and yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I think maybe just to also add that in terms of restoration, uh, one of the barriers is I don't think enough funding is ever going to come from government sources that's going to deliver the, the scale of restoration that we need. So you have to work out ways to kind of unlock private finance to do that, which we're trying to do through the Reforest Fund, which is also happening through like SBTN and these other kinds of business initiatives. So getting that money from the private sector to fund these kinds of actions, I think is really important too. Great. Thanks so much. We're up on time. A big round of applause for our speakers. So lunch is going to be served outside, and uh, I hope everyone's hungry. I definitely am. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much.